Um, today we have the uh, pleasure of having Simon Larson from uh, Caltech who will talk to us about two-term spectral asymptotics for the Dehichelet Laplacian in a Lipschitz domain. As usual, if you have questions during the talk, either put them in chat or uh, unmute yourself and ask the question um, directly. So Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jan, uh, both for the introduction and for the invitation to, to give a talk here. Uh, so all I'm going to talk about today is uh, joint work with Rupert Frank, uh, containing, I think, two papers. Uh, and it's going to be on the topic of, of semi-classical asymptotics for the Dirichlet Laplacian in a sort of setting of rough geometry. And it's really sort of emphasis on the geometry that's uh, what we've been looking at here. Okay, so just to get the standard definitions out of the way, uh, we're looking at Dirichlet Laplacian only today, uh, which we define through closure of a quadra quadratic form, acting on completely supported functions in some domain omega in d dimensional Euclidean space. And uh, throughout, let's just assume that d is at least two. Since we're talking about geometry, the one dimensional case here is. Uh, a bit special, um, although a lot can be said, uh, but just think of D as at least being two. So if the volume of our uh, domain omega is, is finite, then compactness of, of embeddings tells us that the spectrum of this operator is discrete. And since it's a positive operator, we have a, a just a sequence of positive eigenvalues, uh, which I'll uh, denote by lambda uh, k where k goes from one to infinity. And I'll order them in uh, non-decreasing order. These eigenvalues, they accumulate only at infinity. And really what we're interested in today is how they accumulate at infinity. So the first result in this direction is the, the celebrated vial law, which states, just to remind you all, even if most of you know this, that if you look at the number of eigenvalues below some large number, which I've here written as h to the minus two for some small number h, then that is approximately uh, h to the minus d times the volume of your domain up to a, a dimensional constant here, which won't be important for our purposes today and smaller order terms. Now this was proven by, by Weil in, in 1912, but in the full generality as uh, as stated on, on, on the previous slide, so just open sets of finite measure, then this result is, is due to Rosenblum in, in 1972. Now already Weil himself conjectured that this can actually be refined. Namely, you don't only have the leading order term of order h to the minus d, but you have a second order term, one order higher in d or in h, and this time proportional to the measure of the boundary. Now, clearly this can't be true under the uh, low, same low regularity assumptions as that of Rosenblum's result. If omega is just a domain of finite measure, then the measure of the boundary is uh, very likely to be infinite and this two-term asymptotic expansion just doesn't make sense. So we do need some sort of assumptions on omega for this to be true. And this was in, in, in proven to be true in a breakthrough paper by, by Victor Ivry in 1980 under the following two assumptions that the boundary is smooth and that the measure of the periodic billiards in your domain is zero, uh, seen as a subset of, of the cotangent bundle. Now, what me and Rupert have been working with is sort of results in, in the same direction uh, but for more regular spectral quantities than this counting function. Specifically, we've been working with so-called least means. And today I'm, I'm just going to talk about least means of order one. So that would be the following quantity. Namely, you take your Laplacian, you multiply it by h squared, you shift it by negative one, you take the negative part of this operator and take the trace of that. Uh, I should point out that my negative part is, is positive. Uh, and what we prove is that this quantity enjoys a 
corresponding two-term asymptotic expansion. You have an h to the minus d leading order term proportional to the measure and one order higher term, which is proportional to the measure of the boundary. And we prove this under the assumption of omega being open, bounded, and having Lipschitz regular boundary. Okay, so I have a few remarks on this. Uh, first off, for those of you who are not used to working with these Wiese means, you can write out the trace explicitly. So you're summing over the same eigenvalues that appeared in the counting function on the previous slide, but now we're not just counting the number, but we're summing something that depends on the eigenvalues. And there's a natural generalization of this where you put in a sort of power gamma here on, on, on both sides, which we call the, the Wiese means of order gamma. Uh, so what we're looking at today is Wiese means of order one, while if you interpret this trace correctly, uh, when gamma is zero, this is precisely the counting function. And things get more and more regular when gamma becomes larger. Essentially, you're, you're averaging uh, in a nicer and nicer way these, these eigenvalues. Uh, I should also say that this asymptotic expansion for the, uh, these reads means is equivalent by means of Legendre transform to an asymptotic expansion for the average of the first n eigenvalues as to some n to infinity. So this is essentially the same as looking at sums of eigenvalues. Now, uh, for our results, we do not need to assume anything about periodic buildings. And in terms of the applications that we have in mind, this is rather important for us uh, because well, the structure of the set of periodic billiards is something that's very, very sensitive to geometry and understanding that under sort of small perturbations is uh, not a very easy problem to, to understand. And I want to emphasize that not only don't we assume that their measure is zero, but we get explicit or somewhat explicit bounds on the little o error term here which are sort of controlled by much simpler geometric quantities. There's nothing dynamic going into the error term, even though its precise structure might very well depend on, on this set of, of periodic buildings. Uh, the result is also rather sharp uh, in several aspects. Uh, I want to mention two uh, right now. So first off, on the sort of natural regularity scale, uh, the Lipschitz assumption is essentially the best you can do. If you go below that on the Helder scale, so you look at boundaries which are C0 alpha for some alpha less than one, then immediately you can get or you can construct uh, sets uh, for which the measure of the boundary is, is not finite. And as such, again, this two-term asymptotic expansion in this form uh, cannot uh, be true. There might be suitably uh, generalized versions of it, uh, but that's sort of an, an entire research uh, area in its own right, so I won't go into that here. Uh, secondly, um, this little o term here is, is sharp. You cannot get any quantitative uh, order improvement here, and I'll talk more about that uh, in a couple of slides. Now, our result is not is far from the first uh, in this direction when it comes to uh, semi-classical asymptotics, looking at more regular spectral quantities than the counting function has sort of been an idea that's been around essentially since a while. Uh, and specifically, the result we prove uh, sort of pushes essentially two results uh, forward. Uh, the first of which is, is sort of clear that it's an improvement of is the essentially the precise same statement, but instead of assuming Lipschitz, you assume C1 bound. And this was uh, proved by, by Frank and, and Leander Geisinger back in 2012. However, the sort of passage from C1 to Lipschitz is a rather non-trivial step and, and you need some new ideas. And uh, secondly, uh, on sort of the other side of the spectrum, the same geometric assumptions, namely Lipschitz and, and, and bounded, but you look at a more regular spectral quantity, 
namely the trace of the heat kernel as the time goes to zero. Then Russell Brown proved in 93 that you have a corresponding two-term asymptotic expansion for the heat trace. Um, and the way we actually prove uh, our main result here today is by combining uh, the techniques developed in these two papers in, in a certain way. And I'll, I at least hope to have time to spend roughly half the talk actually discussing how a very clever geometric machinery uh, introduced by Brown, or at least I, I learned it from the paper Brown, uh, can be used to, uh, to, to get two-term asymptotics in, in, in as rough sets as Lipschitz. But before I talk uh, both about the proof and the, the sharpness results for the error term here, I wanted to mention uh, something about the um, applications that me and Rupert had in mind when we started looking at this. So our motivation came from the realm of the, of the spectral shape optimization. And in particular, the problem of maximizing these traces uh, when H is fixed, overall domains of fixed volume, and then understanding how these maximizing domains, uh, provided they exist, how they sort of change when H goes to zero. Now we're quite far from understanding that problem in, in full generality, but uh, sort of due to uh, the results we prove here and some refinements of them, uh, we are able to settle, settle that problem uh, under an additional convexity assumption. So what uh, one of the corollaries of our results is that if you look at the following shape optimization problem, you take your trace uh, for some fixed H, you maximize among all convex domains in RD with measure one, then there exists a, a, a maximizer. That's fairly easy to prove. Yeah. But what's more interesting is that if you take any uh, choice of maximizer for, for each H and then let H go to zero, then up to translations, uh, your maximizers will converge to a ball of unit volume. Now, there have been some results in, in, in this uh, asymptotic spectral shape optimization uh, area before. Uh, there was a very, uh, a very nice paper by, by Antonio Freitas in 2013 or 14, uh, where they studied the problem of minimizing the kth eigenvalue of the Dirichlet Laplacian among unit area rectangles and then understood how these optimal rectangles evolved as k went to infinity. And they get the corresponding result that in the limit they get a, a square. That was also generalized to higher dimensions and also Neumann eigenvalues and several other sort of branches came out of that. Now in the setting that, that me and Rupert were looking at here, this was solved in sort of more restricted classes of convex domains couple of years earlier. Uh, and essentially the, the, the compactness properties or the well postness issues of this asymptotic problem were, were solved or already at that time. Uh, we knew that, uh, that up to translations, these sequences of maximizers had limit points or they were pre-compact in the appropriate topology. Uh, but we couldn't identify uh, the limiting objects and we couldn't say that they were unique. Uh, and the missing ingredient was a uh, rigid enough uh, two-term asymptotic expansion for the easements, which we provide in, in, in our paper on, on Lipschitz asymptotics, sort of settling uh, this problem. And that was sort of the goal we had uh, from the start. So in, in the setting of convex uh, sets, we are able to refine this little o estimate uh, from the general statement to the following. Namely that if we take our trace, we subtract the two-term expansion, we renormalize appropriately in H, then our general statement just says that this here tends to zero as H goes to zero. But if we add the convexity assumption, then we can actually prove a universal inequality valid for all H, namely that this is this expression here is bounded uh, by a power of h, 
positive power of h uh, times the uh, measure of the boundary and the negative power of, of the in radius of your beam. And this is uh, sort of unit uniform enough to, to provide this uh, convergence result here that we would have. Okay, so let's return to general Lipschitz asymptotics and specifically look at the theorem that Brown proved in, in 93. So the geometric assumptions are precisely the same as in my, in my result with Rupert, but we're looking now at the trace of the heat kernel which I think most of you know what that is, but just to write it out, it's the sum of the exponentials of the eigenvalues here. And you look at t going to zero. And correspondingly, uh, you have a, a two-term asymptotic expansion. We have a leading order term, which comes proportional to the volume, a higher order uh, term. Now, this is in terms of square root of t instead of h, but it's the same thing, uh, which is proportional to the measure of the boundary and a small o of the square root of t. And Brown's result is essentially based on, on two key ingredients. Uh, there's a lot of technicalities in between, but these are sort of the two key things that he uses. Uh, on one hand, he uses sharp pointwise bounds for the heat kernel which are valid uh, all the way up to the boundary, provided that the boundary satisfies some geometric assumptions locally. And he essentially constructs a geometric decomposition of a neighborhood of the boundary into points where he has these pointwise bounds and points where he doesn't. And he shows that he can do this in such a way that the set where he doesn't have the bounds is small enough to just discard the thing but this doesn't actually contribute to the trace. And in our setting, while we don't have access to the same uh, pointwise bounds as, as Brown uses, uh, his idea of decomposing a neighborhood of the boundary is, is key to, to what we prove. And I should say already here that uh, all you need to understand to get this second order term, that's behavior that's really happening close to the boundary. Far from the boundary, you essentially only see the, the leading order term. So everything interesting is happening close to the boundary. Okay. So, uh, as I said before, the little o term in my result with Rupert is, is sharp. That is actually also the case for, for Brown's result. So even this uh, much more regular spectral quantity, the trace of the heat kernel, uh, you cannot go uh, below this little o. And this is something that me and Rupert uh, proved in a paper that I think appeared on the archive in, in January this year, uh, which states the following. So this is, up here is just a restatement of Brown's result in terms of a limit instead of a little o uh, statement. So you renormalize re your uh, trace, you subtract the terms of the asymptotic expansion, divide by square root of t and you take the limit and you get zero as soon as omega is uh, So what me and Rupert were able to prove is that you can't do any better than this. Uh, given any uh, non-negative uh, function g, which tends to zero at zero, then we construct a bounded, simply connected Lipschitz regular set omega, which depends on g, such that the corresponding limits, but where we, instead of dividing by square root of t, divide by the slightly smaller quantity, square root of t times g of t, and this limit is not zero, but in fact, we can make it as large as we want. So this really says that you can't, uh, for any function g that goes to zero, have a large O of square root t times g of t error term in the, in the heat trace asymptotics. And for the this means we have a corresponding result. Uh, however, uh, due to the way how we deduce this, we, we lose the limit and uh, only get the result for the limb sip. Essentially, we deduce this by saying that the trace of the heat kernel 
can be written as an appropriate integral of, of these traces. And then, well, if we had a good error term here, we would get a good error term for the trace of heat kernel. So we sort of deduce it backwards. But in that procedure, it's fairly natural that you lose the limit and only get the, the limb sample. Although I think the result might be true with the, with the limit uh, also here. Uh, I should say also that these uh, sets omega g and omega tilde g, then they're actually the same. It's just an integral tra transformation of g to get from, from one to the other. So it's the same construction. Uh, and their properties, sort of their geometric structure is very, very uniform uh, with respect to G. Um, uniformly bounded, simply connect, well, simply connected, can't really be uniform. Uh, the Lipschitz, uh, so the local Lipschitz norm is the same for all of them, independent of G. Uh, you have uniform bound on the measure of the perimeter, uh, essentially everything. In fact, you can construct these sets as an epsilon perturbation of a hypercube uh, with respect to the Hausdorff distance. And the proof is fairly direct. It's, it gets technical at the points, but the, the idea is, is rather straightforward. So what do we do? Well, the problem with, with Lipschitz domains in, in comparison to C1 or, or smoother domains is that, is that you can really have non-trivial structure on all scales. And the idea, uh, is to play these scales against each other. You have scales that are too small for the spectral problem to sort of see, but the geometry still depends on them. So in the setting of the trace of the heat kernel, geometric structures that are on the scale, on a scale much smaller than square root of t, uh, they don't really affect the trace that much. Uh, however, they do have a, a, a somewhat large effect on, on the geometric quantities that appear in the two term asymptotic expansion, namely the area and the perimeter. And the game is to play these sort of three effect, effects against each other and show that you can actually win in, in the end. So the construction we, we do is very much based on this. And it is enough to do it in, in two dimensions. In higher dimensions, you take the set that I will show you how to construct and take products with uh, an appropriate number of intervals and you're, you get your example for, for higher dimensions. So the construction in two dimensions, you start with uh, a macroscopic square. So just take the, the unit square. So I haven't drawn all of it here, but you get the picture. And to its edges, you add a disjoint number of the uh, small triangles which we have right angle triangles here and with their size sort of parameterized by a sequence of lengths L, K. And while I've drawn them sort of in a nice decreasing fashion here on, on one side of the square, this is not important at all. Uh, for the proof, we do need that they have at least one accumulation point, which is not uh, at a corner, but that's probably just technical reasons. Um, so why does this sort of give you what you want? Well, the idea is that if you remove, so you make an inner approximation of this set here by removing all the triangles that are at the scale smaller than square root of t, you can prove that that has an order t uh, effect on the heat trace, but it has a order square root t effect on the uh, perimeter. And sorry, the, the order t on the heat trace is after renormalization, so there's a t to the minus t over 2 in front of everything. Uh, but at least these two effects sort of uh, are, are relatively of the same size. And one comes with a positive sign, one comes with a negative sign. There's also an effect uh, on, on the, the area. You're losing some area when you make this approximation. But in the end, you can show that you can choose your, your sequence in such a way that the uh, 
perimeter term really dominates everything and, and gives you what you want. So the idea is straightforward, but it gets technical uh, along the way. Okay, so actually what inspired this entire project for me and Rupert was that uh, Brown in his paper from 93 actually commented that his little O term was sharp on the scale of powers of, of T. He did not provide a proof. Uh, so when we wanted to quote this for, for our paper on the chips asymptotics, uh, we sort of, we were a bit skeptical to sort of say that, okay, Brown has a construction because we had no idea what proof he had in mind. And at the time we uh, failed to do this construction. Uh, but, but later on, we, we figured out uh, essentially how to do it. And I, I'm pretty sure that this is the same idea that Brown had in mind when he, he wrote this. But in, in writing it up, we realized that we could push this uh, construction really to the limit and not only get, not only rule out uh, power-like improvements, but, but any improvement at all. Uh, a, a second note is that if you look at the uh, county function, then uh, just a year after he reproved his result, uh, Lasutkin and, and Thurman proved that under the assumptions of, of Ivry's uh, result, so uh, smooth boundary and uh, measure zero periodic billiards, uh, that you can construct a, a convex set or a family of convex sets, I might say, uh, such that, well, first of all, they satisfy Ivry's uh, assumptions. So you have a two term asymptotic expansion with a small O term, uh, but they prove that you do not get anything better than the small O term, again, on the uh, level of the powers now of H instead of T. The reason I mentioned this is mainly because of the result I, I, I mentioned in connection to the uh, shape optimization problem, namely that if we go from the counting function up to the reasoning of order one, then me and Rupert actually proved that you do have a power-like improvement, namely the error term is uh, no larger than h to the, of the usual power plus one eleventh, which is probably not sharp, but you do have this uniformly for all convex domains. So there's something very different going on uh, here for the trace in comparison to the, the counting function. And you can really see this in, in the construction of Lasutkin and Terman as well. They really play with constructing a convex set, which has a very complicated structure to the set of periodic billiards. Even though the set has measure zero, it is complicated enough to really have a significant effect on the error term. And what me and Rupert sort of are able to show both in this convex setting and in the general Lipschitz setting is that these effects are much, much smaller when you look at the traits. You can always bound them in, in terms of purely geometric objects, uh, which is uh, very nice if you want to try to do sort of the shape optimization. Because geometric objects, or the geometric objects that we consider are much more stable than these uh, dynamic uh, quantities. OK, so I think. Uh, that is roughly half of my talk. So from now on, I'm going to hopefully give you an idea of what goes into proving our main result and, and what difficulties there really are for Lipschitz sets in, in comparison to, to C1 sets or even smoother sets. So this is what we want to prove. We want to prove that we have a two-term asymptotic expansion for, for these reasons. Now, it will probably not surprise anybody who has uh, ever worked in the subject that we're going to do this by looking at uh, suitably localized problems. And the way we're going to localize is going to be with respect to some length scale that we choose adapted to our geometry uh, and, and to H. And then we're going to study uh, sort of local problems at this length scale, depending on where we are. So this length is going to, just going to be given by a, a, a positive function on Rd. It has to be uh, sort of slowly varying for us not to get uh, into problems with sort of uh, 
errors that we make along the way. Uh, we also want this length to be much, much larger than h uh, everywhere. And this is essentially since at a point u, we're going to look at a localized problem in a ball of radius l of u. And if l was not much larger than, than h, then the, the local problem would no longer sort of be of some classical nature. We would be looking at only a finite number of eigenvalues, and then things really get more difficult. Or at least you, take, you need to take more details into account. Here we hope to just be able to do some classics all the way. Now, there will be three sort of quantifiers that will appear uh, throughout this construction. And um, unfortunately, to get into the geometry, I, I have to talk about them a bit. So there's going to be a delta, an r, and an epsilon, all, all positive. Uh, the first quantity, delta, it essentially just quantifies uh, this relation here. Namely, our localization scale, with the smallest scale at which we localize, is going to be precisely h over delta, which, if the delta is small, is much larger than h. Uh, secondly, there are going to be two uh, quantifiers for the, the geometry close to the boundary. Uh, and there's going, to, there's going to be a length scale r, which is the radius of a ball uh, close to the boundary. And this is sort of the scale at which we consider the geometry of the boundary. So in particular, if r is small enough, since we're in the Lipschitz set, then if we have a ball close to the boundary of size r, and r is small, then our boundary is just given or can be parameterized by the graph of a Lipschitz function. Uh, and then there's going to be an epsilon, which uh, quantifies how well behaved the boundary is at this scale r. And essentially, that's going to be a, a local flatness uh, kind of thing. And with these things uh, on hand, uh, the sort of overall goal for what we want to prove, so the, the restatement of this result here, but in terms of the, the quantifiers, is that Essentially, we just view delta r and epsilon as as fixed. Then we want to prove that if we look at the trace minus the two-term expansion, correctly normalized, and we let h go to zero, then this can be bounded from above in terms of some function, which depends on our geometry and our three parameters. What sort of needs to be shown in order to get a little low is then just that we can uh, choose a way to send delta r and epsilon to zero so that this guy vanishes. Or, well, uh, actually zero isn't necessary, but just choose delta r and epsilon so that this guy is, is as small as possible. Okay, so now that we sort of have the general goal uh, hopefully clear, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how we construct this localization. And after that, I'm going to focus mainly on sort of the geometric ingredients that go into studying the local problems close to the boundary, which is where everything interesting is happening. So the construction we use is uh, something we, we take from a paper by, by Solovey and Spitzer, uh, where they construct, they construct a much more general uh, sort of coherent state uh, transform. Here, we just use the localization part of that. Uh, namely, we construct a family of functions phi indexed by a, a point in space, uh, which we call u. And all of these functions are, are smooth and convexly supported. Namely, they have support inside this uh, local ball around u of size l. Now, uh, the important property for us is essentially that these uh, functions form a, a continuum partition of unity with respect to u. So if you, for any fixed x in, in Rd, integrate with respect to u, the square of these functions against this uh, length dependent weight, then you just get one, or at least uh, for almost every x is enough for us. So this is essentially a, a partition of unity. Now, by a fairly simple argument, just involving an IMS localization uh, and uh, 
a Li Tiering or a Briasin Li Liao uh, type inequality. You can show that, uh, well, first of all, let, let me write this operator that we're considering just as H omega to save some space. So if we look at the trace that we're interested in, then that can be approximated by now an integral over these localized traces where we sandwiched H in between two copies of our localization function. And then this integral here approximates our trace up to an error. Now, H to the minus D plus two here looks very, very good. That's one order higher than, than we actually need. Uh, however, you should remember that the length is hopefully, or we do want to choose the length fairly small to actually gain anything. So since we're integrating a negative power of the length, we need to choose it somewhat carefully not to lose uh, too much in this localization. And the way we do that is by essentially doing a, a Whitney-like uh, choice of, the, of this length. Uh, so in particular, when we're far from the boundary, we choose our length scale just to be a, a half the distance to the complement. While if we're close to the boundary or even in the, in the complement of our set, we just set it to be some small fixed length L0, which will precisely be this H over delta. So something that's still very small, small when H goes to zero, but much, much larger than H. With this particular choice, uh, it is not too difficult to show that this uh, term here can be actually estimated by h to the minus d plus one times a, a delta. So since delta will eventually go to zero, this is, uh, this is good enough for us. And, and the gain from this minus two here really comes from that it's only in a small neighborhood of the boundary that the length, that the length is small. So if, if you're further than L0 from the boundary, then the LU is, is large and doesn't really contribute much to this integral. And, and that's where you sort of get the extra power of H. Okay, so with this uh, length scale, uh, I want to note two, two things. First off, that, the, that if, or the property that U is such that the local problem at U is completely contained in omega, that is equivalent to the distance to the boundary being larger than this L0, or at least L0. Uh, similarly, uh, if we instead intersect the boundary, so this is when we're close to the boundary, uh, then well, the distance to the boundary is less than L0, and moreover, this length scale is just given by this constant. So there's nothing funny going on with the length scale when we're, once we're close to the boundary. Okay, so with our sort of local problems in, in hand, uh, we split them into, into sort of different categories depending on the geometry. Uh, the first kind of localization is sort of a, a very simple for us. That's the case when the entire local problem is contained inside our domain. Then this operator here actually doesn't depend on omega. You can replace omega by by RD. And in that case, you can use Fourier analysis uh, to actually compute a, a very precise you know, one-term asymptotic expansion for, for this trace. However, the error you get is one order higher than what we're looking for. There are no boundary terms uh, coming in here. There's no boundary. Uh, so all we get is a, well, now a, a weighted volume in terms of this phi uh, and of the, the correct order, the same as the, the viral term. So here everything is, is, is good uh, and we really don't need to do anything else. One can note that this error term that we have here is precisely, or once we multiply it by the appropriate power of L, integrating this out is precisely the same error term that we estimated for the localization method. So that does not contribute to, uh, to the orders that we are interested in. Okay, so if we are instead close to the boundary, so this is where everything interesting is happening. So if your intersection of your local ball with the boundary is, is non-empty and sufficiently nice, uh, one would hope that we have a corresponding two-term asymptotic expansion, namely this, this localized trace 
you have this intermediate order term, and then you have a one order higher correction, which now comes as a boundary integral, but again, weighted in terms of this function. And a error estimate here, which you can sort of control in some uniform sense in, with respect to this point u. Now, uh, if the local boundary in your inner ball BL here is, for instance, C1, then this is indeed true. And you can control this quantity in terms of the uh, C1 modulus of continuity, just by essentially applying a straightening of the boundary type argument. And again, using for your analysis to uh, diagonalize the effective operator in the half space that we get down from that. And that is precisely what uh, Frank and Geising do. So far, we have not deviated from their proof uh, the slightest. Unfortunately, in the Lipschitz setting, these local problems at the boundary are no better than, uh, than our global problem. In fact, they are, it's, it, this here is a more general statement than what we want to prove. We have changed our operator to a non-constant coefficient operator and we want to prove a two-term asymptotic expansion for that. So this is more general than what we actually want to prove. So how have we actually gained anything here? Well, the point is that, as I said, Lipschitz sets at a pointwise level, they don't get better when you look at small scale. But in some sort of average sense, they do. For instance, just look at Rademacher's theorem that Lipschitz functions are almost everywhere differentiable. So for almost every u close to the boundary, the boundary will look better than just general Lipschitz. It will be rather flat. It will be well approximated by a, a hyperplane. So the question now is essentially, how do we quantify this? How do we find a large enough set of points u where we can essentially prove this? We won't actually prove this, but we'll prove it version of it, which is good enough. Uh, and still have sort of that the use that are not covered by this uh, property that we can that we can do a two term asymptotic expansion is still small enough to ignore for the contributions to the trace. Uh, so this is one point where doing a continuum partition of unity instead of a discrete one sort of has uh, clear advantages. Otherwise, you would have to sort of do the separation between good and bad points in, in a discrete setting instead of a continuum one. And then it's counting points instead of just estimated measures, which is usually, uh, at least I find that hard. Okay, so how do we make this distinction between good and bad points close to the boundary? We follow Brown. So what Brown does, well, this is a slight variant of what Brown does, but essentially it's, it's uh, in, in the same, uh, very much in the same direction. So I'm, I'm going to give you the definitions, but you don't actually need to read them. Just look at the pictures. So we're going to look at this picture uh, several times. I'm going to add more and more geometric structure to it as we go along. And well, I can't draw in higher dimensions than two. Uh, so, but all the pictures are, uh, you think of them as, as rotationally invariant around this direction mu here. So we have a symmetry axis uh, mu going through a point p. Okay, so the, the first uh, thing we define is a set of good points on the boundary. And we define a, or we say that a point is epsilon r good in, in terms of our two small parameters epsilon and r. If the point here, which lies on the boundary, first of all, it should have an inward pointing unit normal, unique inward pointing normal. And more than that, if you look in a ball of, of radius r, the boundary should be contained in this uh, complement of a two-sided cone. So in two dimensions, it's the cone itself, but uh, so the complement of this two-sided cone in higher dimensions where the opening angle is essentially pi over two minus epsilon. Well, I say approximately, but yeah. Uh, okay, so why are these points? Uh, that's good. 
why are there many of them for one point? Well, if you look at these, uh, this definition, so we, we let G epsilon R here be the set of all epsilon R good points in our band. And essentially a direct consequence of Latimer's theorem is that if you look at the portion of the boundary, which is not epsilon R good, we denote that by, by mu. And if you fix epsilon and let R go to zero, then this quantity tends to zero. Essentially that is uh, really just rather much as that work. You have approximate hyperplanes at almost all points. And if your boundary lies in this sort of small cone, then, or well, if you have an approximate tangent plane, then for small enough R, your uh, boundary will lie in this uh, complement of this two-sided two cone. Now, we weren't looking for a good set of points just on the boundary. The local problems that we were interested in, they were centered at points that not only lived on the boundary, but close to the boundary. So we want to extend this uh, concept of epsilon R good points to a boundary neighborhood. So the way that is done is by calling points which now lie in this shaded area here, epsilon R good points. Uh, so again, for an epsilon R good point on the boundary P, we can define this two-sided uh, circular cone now of opening, opening angle proportional to epsilon and truncated here at r over two. And by taking the union over all the epsilon r good points in the boundary, we get something that essentially is a r over two neighborhood of the boundary. And this will be the, the good set that we the, that we work with. Note that if we, for instance, have a large corner uh, on our set, just think of a square, then there will be some neighborhood of that corner that is not uh, epsilon r good in this sense, but that will shrink very quickly with respect to all of these parameters. Sort of a lower co-dimension set than the boundary. So that will actually not affect us much. And to sort of see why that is the case uh, in general, uh, we have the following uh, lemma. So if we look at, this here is a two-sided uh, neighborhood of bound distance uh, S, and we remove this, uh, I didn't say that, but script, epsilon, script G epsilon R is the union of all these two-sided cones over all the epsilon R good points on the bound. So we remove this approximate neighborhood of the boundary. Then we uh, divide by the sort of expected measure of this guy. And what this says is that that is uh, small in respect to the parameters of the problem. So we got our, our portion here of epsilon R good points on the boundary that we know goes to zero when R goes to zero. This theta of S here is essentially defined by how well our boundary is, or how well a two-sided neighborhood of our boundary is approximated by, uh, in volume, by, by, by 2s times the measure of the parameter. And it's sort of a well, fairly well-known fact that if the boundary is compact and Lipschitz, this quantity is actually smaller than one when it's close to zero. And then there's an epsilon here, which that's not very important. Okay, so from this, it's sort of immediately, or almost immediately clear that we can disregard uh, the local problems that come from points that are outside this G epsilon R. So that's good. We are just left with our good points. What remains is to actually treat the good points because they're, they're good, but they're not, they're not relevant. Uh, they're still not even close to being C1. So how do we do that? Well, we add more geometric structure and approximate uh, our local problem in terms of that. So uh, same picture again, but now there's a point U here, which is the, just take a point, which is one of our good points. So in particular, there is some P such that uh, U is in this two-sided 
Now, how do we approximate uh, our settlement? Well, there will be three additional geometric structures that need to be done. The first is sort of an inner approximation, and that is defined by just taking the one-sided circular cone now that lies below uh, this, well, not line, but these two lines here, call that I epsilon. So that now depends on u through the point p and epsilon and r and, and all of these things. Uh, similarly, we do an outer approximation, uh, u epsilon r, which is everything that lies below this set here. So that's the complement of sort of the outwards two-sided or one-sided cone here. Uh, and one final um, additional geometric structure. We find a, a hyperplane which lies in the, uh, or sorry, we find a half space which contains the inner approximation and is contained in the, this outer approximation u epsilon. Uh, in particular, it, it passes through p here. And we choose it in such a way that the distance from our point u to the boundary of this half space coincides with the distance uh, of u to the, to the boundary of, of, of our domain. So I won't actually have time to go into why that's important, but that's the only way how we specify this hyperplane. And it has to do when, uh, that when, when integrating up all these local traces and totics, uh, this choice here makes it possible to use sort of co-area type uh, tricks to, to compute the various intervals that, that appear. Okay, so how does this lead us to, to an approximation for our local trace? Where we, we do, we want to replace omega with this uh, half space. And why can we do that? Well, we note the following uh, sort of inclusions that are, are clear from the construction. Namely that, well, if we have U as in the on the previous slide, and L is small enough, and specifically less than R over two, then your domain omega intersected with this localization ball is contained in the corresponding intersection with this U epsilon and contains similarly the intersection with I epsilon. And the same thing holds true if we replace omega by, by this half space. Now, this is the point where it becomes crucial for us to actually only look at the Dirichlet Laplacian. Uh, namely, we use monotonicity under domain inclusions. And if you uh, sort of work this out appropriately and take into account that my negative part is positive, uh, you get the following uh, six or four inequalities. And if you just rearrange those, we can see that the difference between the trace we're interested in and the trace uh, in the half space problem is bounded by the difference of the traces of these sort of conical sets. This is precisely cone, but u epsilon is not really a cone. So what remains to do is, first off, we need to show that this is actually small enough uh, to be integrated up and, and not contribute to, to the terms we're interested in. And after that, we need to be able to compute the integral uh, of these uh, local problems, but in these associated half spaces. And while all of this is not entirely trivial, uh, it's um, somewhat of a what's a technical exercise in, in, in Lipschitz calculus, um, and. All, all, all we do to, to estimate the size of this difference of traces is to use uh, asymptotic expansions for the two quantities and compare the different order terms. So we don't really need any deep uh, spectral knowledge to, to, to do this. And in, in particular, since these sets are definitely Lipschitz, uh, we do need to be able to compute those asymptotics to, to be able to prove our own theorems. 
uh, but it's it's much simpler since it's a toy model of a virtual system. Okay, so skipping all this geometric integration and estimating of all these various errors, uh, what one arrives at after pages and pages of calculations is that the trace we're interested in minus our two term asymptotic expansion, appropriately normalized, can be bounded from above by some constant, which depends on, on our set, but in a fairly uh, nice way, times uh, some power of delta, some combinations of epsilon and delta, and the two terms that appeared in this uh, geometric construction. So there's the theta, was, which was the error in the volume approximation for two-side neighborhood of the boundary, and this mu, which was the portion of the boundary that was epsilon or r good. So what remains is just to choose an appropriate way to send delta epsilon r to zero so that this here vanishes. Well, first off, if we send h to zero, which we wanted to do here, uh, then this guy vanishes because we have, still have an h here. Now that all that is done, we can send r to zero, and by our claim about this portion here, that goes to zero. Then we're free to send epsilon to zero, and then finally delta to zero, and all of these terms disappear. So we arrive at the, the conclusion we wanted. And I have a couple of minutes left, so just a few final sort of concluding remarks. Uh, as I, as I said sort of early on when we were talking about uh, the shape optimization problem, all of this can be made uh, sort of quantitative if you restrict the geometry further. For instance, we did this for, for convex domains. Then you can explicitly construct these uh, good sets on the boundary and control their respective measure and everything you end up with is, is quantitative. Uh, I also want to point out that this method is, is very rather stable uh, when it comes to different sort of operators. We can definitely treat Schrodinger operators, uh, non-constant coefficient operators, fractional Laplacians, uh, and this has been done in, in various settings. Uh, but sort of the new things that we add here how to treat Lipschitz uh, boundaries really is mainly a geometric uh, argument. We do make some refinements of the method in general, but that is not affected by the operator. However, the uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions are crucial precisely for this uh, monotonicity under inclusion argument that we uh, sort of ended with here. With that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, for the nice talk. And uh, uh, we have time for questions now. If anyone has questions, please just speak up. Uh, I, I I have one. So um, when when uh, you give your your counter example to to the fact that one would. That we can't when you show that we can't improve basically this uh, this asymptotic result uh, in, in in any way would there be it is it clear how to put say geometric conditions on the perturbation so that you could get improvement uh, on the on the remainder I don't I don't know if my question is clear uh, no I I think you're, it's it's somewhat clear but it's uh... And definitely there, there are assumptions that you can put that would enable you to, to get an improvement. That for instance, any, if you have C1 boundary mm -hmm. uh, with, and, and you sort of with a given modulus of continuity, mm -hmm. uh, then this argument fails. Uh, then, then, you, then you do get a quantitative improvement and that's essentially contained in the, uh, in the uh, paper by, by Frank and Geisler. Although they don't have the geometric dependence as carefully as we do. Mm. But on the sort of Lipschitz setting, I, I, 
I, I don't know of any sort of natural uh, conditions. Uh, essentially, you see that sort of in the example we construct, the local Lipschitz form is, is, is uniform. It's just square root of two. Yeah, yeah that's true. But it's a, it's a good question. There is a question in the chat also by Bernard Elfer. He's asking, can we have a third term assuming the boundary is C2 with uh, the additional no periodic orbit condition? A good question. Uh, well, I, I, my guess would be yes, but whether we can push this to proof it's a bit uncertain because essentially already the localization error is of the same order as, as that term that you want to extract. If one was looking at, it, it might be possible, uh, but, but I can't say sort of uh, for sure. If you look at sort of polygonal domains, then you can sort of do this in, in a different direction, then you don't change your localization scale with respect to the distance to the boundary, or not only, but you sh sort of you put the smallest localization just close to the uh, the, the corner sort of like one dimensional lower substructures of the boundary if you're in higher dimensions. Because if you're close to the boundary, but not a corner, then well, you can compute everything explicitly. So that still works. And then with that, nicer localization or you're localizing a lower dimensional set, then you should be able to get an improved estimate for the localization error. But C2 in general, I, I don't know, it's it's difficult. Uh, either. Can I speak or I? Yes, sure. You do you hear me? I, I, I hear you fine. Yes. Okay, the point is uh, usually uh, I that each time that, that you, when you look to these three means, each time that you increase by one, you get one more term in spirit. So. I, I agree with that, but it's, it's easy to prove. <laughs> At least for the semi-classical analysis of Hamiltonians, for problem without boundary, this is what we have with with uh, with, with Robert. And I guess if, if, you, if you go so far as to the trace of the heat kernel, then then it's it's known for C2, I think. Smooth for sure. For smooth for sure, it's known. There's a, a secondary term. You can do Neumann and Robin. But for Lipschitz, I, yes. I don't yeah. think. Each time you have to add the regularity and the assumptions, I suppose. <laughs> I would say that, uh, okay. I would say that the answer is probably yes, and I will explain why I think so. Normally, when you go um, to um, take more smooth boundary, you will get uh, H minus D plus two. Can you improve this? Maybe. You see, uh, uh, what prevents us from getting better results. Uh, well, uh, look, uh, for example, at um, hemisphere, then uh, all the trajectories are periodic. So uh, there would be no second term uh, if you um, consider eigenvalue accounting function. However, when you consider um, this means, then um, clusters are so narrow that probably answer would be yes. Yes, I think you're right in that. Because it's some of again various. Anyone else wants to uh, comment or ask questions? Yes, I, I have a comment or question uh, regarding the Neumann or Robin, which you're struggling with. Uh, I don't know how to do this, but there is a feature that if you look at the difference of the least means for, let's say, Robin and Neumann or two Robin, then you can actually get a, a, a main term for that, a constant. 
that is possible, at least in, in the piecewise smooth case. I don't know the general Lipschitz case, but that is, that is possible. So even though I don't know how to do each, you know, Neumann individually, I can subtract out the two things and, there is, and recover the structure. That is interesting. Thank you. The argument is completely different, but, but uh, that, I don't know if it indicates that there is something to do in the Neumann case or not, but the, if, you, if you difference two problems, two boundary value problems, you can get the structure. Anyone else would like to ask a question or a comment? If not, let's thank Simon again. Um, okay, we will reconvene next week uh, for the last talk of the seminar this year with a talk by Marco Marletta, who will speak about the Laplace operator with boundary conditions that is um, singular at one point. Uh, have a great week and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.